representatives of national plant protection offices, dear representatives of authorities, um, dear representatives of the seed sector, colleagues, dear friends. I'm Michael Keller, Secretary General um, of the International Seed Federation, and I'm very happy today to welcome you for another exclusive event on Channel Wool Seed, which is an event for members of ISF, but also invited guests. I'm very happy also to see that this time we have a record-breaking number of people who registered because we have nearly reached 170 persons, which is really good to see for such an event. Today, it's an opportunity for us to build further dialogue between all of us together. This episode today should provide you, the seed sector's perspective on topics which are important for us and also for you, and which are currently under discussion um, by the International Brand Protection Convention. Currently meetings are taking place and will end early April. As you know, the seed sector is and was and will be always willing to work alongside and together with governments, with international organizations on phytosanitary measures. And yes, seed is moving. And since many years, more and more seed is moving. This is steadily increasing. At the same time, private sector is committed to healthy seed. And on top of this, we should not forget seed is the foundational contributor to food production. And don't forget, the last months, we all faced COVID around the world. And there it was an absolute priority for us also the seed sector to be able to continue to supply seed around the world. We would not have been able without cooperating in these difficult times strongly with national authorities, with the international organizations to move forward also in trust. With this in mind, I am now very happy to give the floor to my wonderful colleague, everybody calls her Dr. Rose, who will moderate now the session. And I hope it will be an open-minded, but also efficient dialogue between you, our guests, our members of ISF, between the public and private sector. Please, Rose, for you start the moderation. Thank you so much, Michael. It is a pleasure to be here and good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you. It is really a great pleasure to have you all here with us to be able to talk about specific topics which are relevant to the seed industry. And also some topics that will be relevant to the private sector as a whole. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to the first topic of the session today, which it is systems approach. Last year, the International Plant Protection Convention has released for country consultation a draft, a draft specification of annex that will be implemented on the ISPM 38. This document calls Annex 1, Design and Use of Systems Approach for Phytocentric Certification of Seeds. The current phytocentric landscape is creating numerous challenge and unpredictable environment for the seed industry, but also for other industries to expand more on this topic and to provide you all with the relevance of the adoption of systems approach for the seed industry, I would like to invite you, the chair of the ISF systems approach working group and global manager of industry affairs for BSF, Mrs. Meryl Langens. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rose. I will share my screen. Presentation mode. Okay, can you see the, the first slide at this moment? Yes, we can, Meryl. Okay, well, hello everybody. And uh, thank you, Rose, for your kind introduction. Um, I will indeed talk about uh, systems approach today. And it's indeed one of the topics that is in discussion in IPPC. 
Um, I'll talk shortly about why we work on systems approach, assuming that many of you have already been uh, have already heard about this initiative in earlier meetings of ISF and earlier briefings. I'll talk a bit about our outreach activities, uh, the interactions with IPPC, um, and about some of the key topics we are working on. And finally, in the last, last slide, I'll give an outlook on future actions. Okay, this slide shows why there is a working group in ISF working on systems approach. Like Rose also already said, there are some serious challenges in the current sea trade. And basically those challenges can be uh, summarized in two words, increasing complexity. Increasing complexity because more and more specific pest requirements in different countries. These requirements are not necessarily harmonized between countries. Requirements can change quickly. They are not always for pests that are associated with seed as a pathway. Um, Re-export, that makes it necessary to fulfill all the practices of the, all the requirements of the countries in the chain becomes more and more challenging. And the movement of small seed lots, the research lots and the seed lots for breeding purposes is also becoming increasingly difficult because of this web, complicated, more and more complicated web of requirements that have to be fulfilled. Um, the idea behind systems approach is that uh, companies may become certified, certified based on the pest risk management options that they have in place, based on their systems. And the uh, certified companies, they produce systems approach seed. And the idea is that this seed can move easily between all the countries that have accepted systems approach, so that recognize this certification system. One of the consequences um, that we have in mind is that the phytosanitary certificates for these countries do not need to uh, contain any additional declarations anymore. Well, basically, there could be one additional declarations. And here you see, as an example, uh, a declaration produced under systems approach. And this statement would then certify that all the requirements, all the needs of the countries that uh, recognized systems approach are fulfilled. We don't mean to develop systems approach as a replacement of the current system for import and export of seeds, but it's really an alternative, an alternative options, option for countries to participate. How do we approach this? Because it's, it's a big undertaking, it's about global acceptance, and well, as you know, for global acceptance, support of IPPC is essential. And that's why we try and work as much as possible with IPPC. And Rose already told there is a proposal, a specification has been accepted, meaning that there will be an IPPC expert working group working on this annex in which it will be described how systems approach could be implemented. And ISF may have a seat in that group. And what have we done as industry for this? We have promoted, we have supported the development of the proposal. Further discussions with IPPC are in preparation and we're preparing the industry viewpoints on the tasks that are described in the specification, the tasks for the IPPC expert working group. Another important part of our approach is to start small and work from success. We've started um, the conversations with a limited number of countries. You can see the countries uh, which they are in the slide um, with the idea that once we can work out this idea with a small number of, of countries, it can then later be accepted and implemented in a larger number of countries. And in our discussions with MPPOs, the, the MPPO experts, they indicated that they would really like to see um, an industry vision on systems approach. So how do we as industry, because it's a complicated uh, concept to work out, a lot of, lot of things to, to think about. And so they requested to work out this industry vision on systems approach. And well, as an industry, we've been, uh, we've been working on that, uh, organized several workshops. There is an industry brief available now in which um, the industry point of view on how systems approach could work is described. It's currently an internal industry doc document that I highly recommend to all industry participants that are present in the call to have a look at, to uh, get more background information about systems approach. And using this document, 
we will provide more information and develop more information to support discussions with IPPC. So that's a bit about the actions and the outreach that we have been doing. Now a bit more about the content of systems approach, what, what does it really mean? And in this slide, you see a list of essential elements, at least from an industry point of view, for the system. As I said, the system should be in line with the IPPC standards, otherwise globally acceptance will be difficult. It's an alternative, it's not a replacement of the current system. It's based on certification of companies, meaning that this is about quality management systems, audit systems that should all be organized. We strive for global harmonization via multilateral agreements, which could be challenging because the current way of working in IPPC is via bilateral agreements. So maybe we have to end up in acceptance of multiple harmonized bilateral agreements. Systems should be risk-based, data-driven um, for small and large companies. It should accommodate the needs of the different crops. And we also propose that current practices that the industry has in place for hygiene management, for preventing uh, uh, or, or to, to mitigate the risks of pests entering the seed production, will also be incorporated in a systems approach. Um, because seed companies already have many procedures in place to basically to prevent the infection and infestation of seeds with seed transmitted pests, and implementation of the systems approach will leverage these current industry practices. And of course, also the system is supposed to be non-competitive. Then two topics that will be challenging. I've talked a bit about this one already, multilateral acceptance. It's essential for systems approach to work because the pest management options that are applied in the country of origin, in the country of seed production, should be acceptable to multiple MPPOs. And We've been thinking about how, what, how, how does this look, this multiple multilateral acceptance? What, what is it that is multilaterally accepted? And in the end, it will be promoted by, by clarity about the content of the system beforehand. And we think if there could be agreement about the pests in scope, about what are the relevant seed transmitted pests in scope, and if we agree about how do these pests enter the seed production, how do they spread in the seed production? Based on this risk assessment, the pathway analysis, there could be agreement about a list of pest management options for specific crops per phase of a seed production. So by, yeah, by, by agreeing beforehand about the starting points, you could probably more easily come to a multilaterally accepted system. But this will require some further discussions with MPPOs. Building trust is also an important topic. It's also important for, uh, th there should be trust between MPPOs and industry to make this system work. On one hand, this trust can be built by the transparency from the side of the industry about the pest management options that are currently in use. Um, another part, that's another topic that's important for, for trust is that MPPOs indicated in, in when we had the talks with them that increased transparency of the seed industry is desirable. And this is, of course, a sensitive topic where trust is really needed. Because on one hand, there's limited trust that seed companies inform MPPOs about risks that they are aware of, like emerging pests or outbreaks. And on the other hand, likewise, there is limited trust with the seed companies about risk evaluation by MPPOs. Rumors about new findings may lead to phytosanitary and trade barrier measures. A possible solution could be to describe a process to report on emerging pests and outbreaks, and also to clarify the collaboration between the seed sector and MPPOs on defining response measures. Some thoughts about the structure of the Annex. You see here the ISBM 38 and the Annex. The Annex will contain Will not be a detailed document but it will describe the framework like what are the elements that should be in the quality management system what is this procedure for reporting of pests how does this guidance on pathway analysis work what are the audits what are the certification and a topic that we uh, are developing thoughts about is should there be appendices to the annex in which the, the pathway analysis and the specific pest management options per crop are described 
thoughts in development. Um, finally, an outlook on what we want to do in the near future. We want to do a pilot with four countries. And in this pilot, we want to trial the ideas that we have developed so far in collaboration, of course, with MPPOs. The complete pathway from production to processing to commercial planting. And with the output of that uh, pilot, we will bring that information uh, to IPPC to support the discussions. And hopefully we can show that a multilaterally accepted systems approach is possible with a small group of countries as a start. Here you see which countries have agreed to participate. Chile, country of production, countries of re-export, Netherlands and USA, and country of sales, Australia. We'll work on Cucumber, start with bilateral meetings with the MPPOs, then have a meeting with the whole group, first agree about the process on paper, and finally, hopefully we can also do actual shipments of seeds. And this, yeah, this is all things that we want to do in the near future. And with that, I want to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think the questions we will do afterwards, right, Rose? That's correct, Mero. So thank you so much for your presentation. Please, for all the participants, put your questions already on the Q&A and we will address them in the end of all the presentations. Thank you so much for that, Mero. And I would like to just highlight that our second topic for today is about the draft standard for requirements for NPPOs if authorizing entities to perform phytosanitary actions. This standard has long been in the making and did suffer a few setbacks, but now I can update you all that it has been adopted during the CPM 15 on its first day, which it was on the 16th of March. To speak a little bit more on this standard and its relevance to us as a seed industry, I would like to welcome Rick Dunkel, which is a member of the SF Systems Approach Working Group, also a member of the SF Phytocentry Committee and Senior Director of Seed Health and Trade for the American Seed Trade Association. My dear friend, Rick, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Rose, let me try to uh, share my screen here and get this uh, up. Uh, yes. Let's see, I still have a problem. Oh, geez. And now we can all see your presentation. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. And again, it's a great uh, privilege to have the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of the International Seed Federation on this particular topic. Um, as Rose mentioned, uh, this draft standard was adopted uh, at CPM 15, uh, March 16th, not, not March 15th. But uh, we were very uh, enthusiastic that uh, this standard has now been adopted. And this standard provides guidance to uh, national plant protection organizations on how to establish a third party, uh, uh, a third party authorization or accreditation system for performing certain phytosanitary actions on behalf of NPPOs. And for the purposes of this presentation, many to most NPPOs actually use the word authorization and, but the word accreditation is more, uh, more used in the industry, but they basically mean the same thing for the purposes of this presentation. And so uh, I wanna highlight, uh, emphasize that this new standard provides requirements for MPPOs if they decide to authorize entities to perform specific phytosanitary actions. So it's not a mandatory standard. It's, a, it's if an MPPO decides to set up a system this particular standard provides the necessary guidance. And again, another emphasis is the fact that uh, under this standard, the MPPOs retain the ultimate responsibility of issuing phytosanitary certificates. So uh, the purpose of the uh, third party uh, system is to collect information that uh, MPPOs need to issue phytosanitary certificates or enforce various regulatory decisions. So, Again, uh, some examples of phytosanitary actions that an MPPO may decide to authorize to an entity or a third party include things like monitoring, sampling, phytosanitary field inspections, in this case, seed health testing, surveillance, treatments, post-entry quarantines, and destruction, destru destruction actions on contaminated uh, seed lots. 
And again, this standard is not specific to seeds. It is third party accreditation in general. Uh, but uh, it, it provides the framework that we urgently need in the seed industry to, uh, to move forward. So again, the word entity is defined in this new standard and it includes uh, providers of phytosanitary actions. And these could be individuals, organizations, enterprises, and where appropriate their facilities, such as equipment, labs, et cetera. And in some cases, authorization of entities may require an MPPO to approve individuals within the entity even who may be responsible for certain phytosanitary actions. So when we look at the elements of an authorization program, how does this work? What does the framework look like? Well, this standard provides guidance to MPPOs on determining the scope of the program. These programs can be very, very narrow to very uh, wide in scope. It provides information on uh, legal frameworks. It emphasizes uh, transparency and integrity. It provides guidance on how an MPPO can go about developing a program, establishing cri uh, criteria for eligibility, uh, documentation requirements. So if an entity wanted to apply to become authorized or accredited, what kind of information does that entity have to provide? And then also it provides guidance on conflict resolution. So where there may be a disagreement between the MPPO and the accredited entity. So again, uh, uh, again, there's a lot of emphasis on accountability, uh, addressing non-conformities. So if there's a problem that arises after, after a, an entity is accredited, uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, and there's a whole uh, litany of, uh, of uh, information relative to appropriately addressing such non-conformities. Uh, training requirements, and this is training not only for the entities, but also for the MPPO staff, because uh, in this situation here, the uh, skills, knowledges, expertise uh, for an MPPO to administer uh, a, an authorization program, those are different from actual phytosanitary uh, actions that they're uh, currently doing now. So how to accredit, how to monitor, how to audit, these are other uh, types of skills that, that the MPPO needs to uh, consider developing. Also transparency, uh, a huge emphasis on how to avoid conflicts of interest, provides the mechanisms and guidance on auditing as well as records management. So when we look at this from the industry perspectives, uh, there are vital roles uh, that the MPPO third party accreditations or authorizations uh, need to have. Uh, and from the industry point of view, these systems expedite phytosanitary certification of seeds sh uh, shipments. Uh, we're, we're running into a, a scenario situation in the seed industry where many, many NPPOs around the world are relying more and more on, for example, seed health testing. And uh, when you do seed health testing for export certification, the burden falls on the exporting NPPO uh, and the laboratory system uh, within that NPPO. And uh, we, we recognize that those laboratories are not just testing for seeds, but they're testing for any commodity that needs to be, uh, for, for which an export certification uh, is needed. So these uh, third party systems will play an, an important role in facilitating safe seed trade. And uh, we want to also recognize that accreditation and auditing, these are very common within the industry. Uh, there are many, many uh, industry driven programs that are set up on the basis of, of auditing and accreditation. And we all have the common uh, goal here. Phytosanitary security is a major aspect of seed quality. And from the industry perspective, any pest in or associated with seed reduces seed quality. So again, when we look at applying this new ISPM to uh, accrediting entities for seed uh, export certification purposes, these vital functions in there uh, include uh, not just uh, the, the, the typical field inspections and seed health testing, but also methods development. And in particular, uh, 
uh, seed health testing methods development is a very, very important uh, um, component here. Uh, transparency of methods and accreditations and audit processes maintain accountability, both within the regulatory community and the industry. So that's where transparency and accountability become very important. Third party accreditation uh, standardizes the use of acceptable phytosanitary practices. So this, this we believe will, pro will provide a great opportunity to uh, work quickly toward harmonization of various practices and methodologies through that third party system. So even though this is a new standard, there are a few uh, MPPOs that have uh, third party uh, authorization systems for seeds. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is the National Seed Health System in the US. However, there are other very strong systems elsewhere such as Nactenbau in the Netherlands, which is a very similar program. Uh, in the US, the National Seed Health System authorizes entities for four basic phytosanitary actions, seed health testing, phytosanitary uh, field and greenhouse inspections, seed sampling and seed visual inspection. The authorized entities under the National Seed Health System include private laboratories, crop improvement associations, university laboratories, as well as a delegated authority to the various state regulatory personnel who act on behalf of uh, USDA. And in, in the United States, there are a number of what we call crop improvement associations that are industry driven associations that provide services to the agricultural industry, to farmers and growers uh, and so forth. And so part of that is phytosanitary field inspections, for example. In the US, the program is administered by Iowa State University uh, under delegated authority provided by USDA APHIS. And the value of having this thing administered through a university is, is uh, it, it, it provides an opportunity for uh, R&D, for research and development, and for pest risk assessment as well through, uh, through the ac academic system. And so the National Seed Health System is also very actively engaged in evaluating and approving seed health testing methods. And this is one of the actually more important functions of the National Seed Health System. And uh, this system is governed through a policy and program advisory board, which is a stakeholder advisory board, where stakeholders are seed companies, uh, state associations, uh, uh, other universities, crop improvement associations, and so forth. And again, when we look at the structure of the National Seed Health System, it is already compliant uh, with, the, uh, with the new uh, uh, international standard. So where are we today? Uh, we believe that the seed industry, this is a great opportunity to encourage MPPOs to consider establishing uh, a third party accreditation or authorization system. And why do I say that? Because there's a mutual benefit here in that it provides value both to the MPPO as well as to the seed industry. Because uh, as, as I've mentioned before, uh, we're really seeing a lot of lag times and bottlenecks and just the ability of NPPOs to provide uh, seed health testing data or, or conduct phytosanitary field inspections or other phytosanitary services in a timely action uh, to get those export certificates issued uh, for the industry. And it's, it's, it can become very costly uh, to develop laboratories and so forth. But if this is transferred to the private sector, there's a, there's a real incentive within the private sector to, uh, to provide these services. And again, we believe that once we uh, ultimately get more uh, NPPO uh, sponsored third party accreditation systems, this will provide uh, an opportunity to further develop and approve harmonized seed health testing methods in, in, in particular. This will, uh, enable more efficient use of limited resources and will expand the capability of NPPOs to issue uh, export and re-export certificates. And again, we're all in the game of wanting to improve overall phytosanitary security. And so uh, 
the, the more this can happen uh, at the international level, uh, I think the better off everybody will be. So again, one of the other emphasis I wanted to make under the National Seed Health System uh, that uh, NPBO should uh, 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 be aware of is that these uh, third party entities, when it comes to seed health testing, they're only authorized or accredited to conduct uh, uh, seed health testing using only methods that are approved by the National Seed Health System. And so these, these, uh, these methods have gone through a validation process uh, and are, are uh, approved by the NPPO for this particular purpose. So accredited ent entities for the purposes of export certification can only use these methods. However, they are allowed to use other methods to provide information to their customers. So with that, I think I'll stop here. And again, uh, I want to uh, compliment the IPPC uh, on the ultimate passage of this international standard. We believe this is gonna be a great benefit both to the NPPOs as well as to the seed industry as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick. And uh, yes, this is a very, very important topic and it's something that uh, working together uh, that we can start to strengthen the message of the third party accreditation, especially when we're talking about seed testing and also the full implementation of uh, systems approaches and things that we would like to go forward. And of course, working together with NPPOs and working together with IPPC to be able to implement these activities, strengthen the, the seed industry in terms of how much more we can provide and how much input we can provide on the work on this, both standards and full implementation. So I would like to go now to our third topic. And our third topic is about the electronic phytosanitary certificate. Since 2011, the Commission on Phytosanitary Measures has already encouraged advancement of electronic certification. And it was during the CPM 9 that it was approved an appendix to the international standard number 12, which is for phytosanitary certificates that describes the format and contents of electronic phytosanitary certificate. A proposal for the long-term of financial sustainability, sustain, sustainability of e was presented now during CPM 15. And the document was drafted to outline an acceptable plan to determine how best to ensure its sustained resource. CPM 15 on its second day decided that the best way forward was to have a small working group with different representatives from the different FAO regions and of course representatives of the industry. And with this, I would like to welcome to, to the floor together with me, uh, Alejandro Castillo, which is the regional director for South Asia, US Grains Council and myself. We are both the co-chairs of the EFITO industry advisor group. And we will present it to you all why EFITO is important for the seed industry and for the private sector as a whole and about the work that the industry advisory group has been done and will carry on doing on outreach activities, which include case studies and workshops with NPPO. I will start by sharing the slides. So why it is important. So the whole idea of the e is designed to significantly improve board efficiency and global coverage, making the movement of goods across borders safer, faster, and cheaper. I can tell you right now that nearly 91 different economies are now registered for e with 41 fully active at the moment. The whole idea of e is to implement an accessible way for all governments to be able to exchange phytosanitary certificates electronically via Global Hub. We have 40 of the current economies which are signed for e -phyto. They are already exchanging phytosanitary certificates electronically. This is really good, but we would like to see more. As you can see from this list of countries here, we have different countries which are in different stages. We have Brazil, Argentina, Morocco, New Zealand, which are fully able to send and receive e fighters electronically, and we have some that are already are still only capable one way. We have Ecuador, Kenya, but there is certain economies, for example, Morocco, which is aiming to be fully digitalized for all imports and exports operations by this year. 
it is important to highlight that nearly 500,000 e-fighters were exchanged in 2020. During the pandemic, it has been highlighted how important it is digitalization on all the activities that we do, especially because that will alleviate and make sure that there will be a, a movement of goods internationally without having to be able to stop doing to very restricted health measures. With that, I would like to hand it over the floor to my colleague, Alejandro Castillo. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rose, and welcome everyone. Thank you for the invitation to have uh, to have this section cover the eFido and the work that, that we've been doing. As Rose said, my name is Alejandra Castillo. I'm the Regional Director for South Asia for the Grains Council, but I'm speaking to you as co-chair of the eFido Solution Program on behalf of the International Grain Trade Coalition, or IGTC, representing the grain industry. So the eFido uh, solution uh, grafted an individualized group to represent the industry uh, and were known as the Industry Advisory Group or the IAG. It was established to provide practical guidance and advice to the IPPC Secretariat on the development and deployment and implementation of the eFido solution on the actual physical trade. So part of our role is to advise the, the Secretariat of the IPPC on the feasibility of the project, i.e. Um, the sustainability and funding, uh, as well as its ability to facilitate efficient, sustainable trade flows amongst different commodity groups. The IAG membership has several members from several industries, and I won't read them all out to you. You can see them on the screen, but you can see that we have fairly good representation across different commodities, across different uh, globe, across the globe, I should say. Um, we are working to provide expertise regarding the commercial implications on how does the eFido actually works from a trade flow to trade flow, country to country, or economy to economy, uh, uh, flow to flow way so that we can not only map out the supply chain, but also understand the areas where the eFido needs to improve or needs to collaborate further amongst different economies. Next slide, please please. So this is just a map. As uh, Rose mentioned, currently there are about 91 different economies that are uh, hooked up to the eFido hub, which is the main server that um, allows countries that have their own uh, uh, exporting systems to join directly to the hub. But 29 different economies are signed up to the gen system, which allows them to hook up to a sub server that then connects to the hub for those country, for those economies that do not have uh, single windows or their own systems of exchanging. So ultimately what the IAG wants to do is to make sure that all of the economies are highlighted green. They are fully on board and they're fully connected and exchanging eFidos. Next slide, please. As Rose mentioned, in the ongoing CPM15 discussions, several funding options were presented by the IPPC to the CPM. There are seven in total that we're presenting. The IAG is supportive of the next ones. Um, the IAG is supportive of a fixed charge per phytosanitary certificate payable to the IPPC, IPPC secretariat by the contracting party, i.e. Uh, different economies, a monthly fee, or an annual fee that takes into consideration several factors affecting each economy, uh, volume, um, usage, et cetera, or a multi-year multi uh, voluntary contribution agreement from national governments, donor organizations, and industry organizations, not individual firms. One of per perhaps one of the, the, the key features of the eFido and the FIDOs today is its impartiality. And we, we at the IAG, want to continue to see that happening. But perhaps most importantly, as Rose mentioned, uh, the IAG is supportive of a small working group that is comprised of government and industry partners like the IAG and others to be established and reporting to the, the eFido steering group, ultimately to ensure that industry continues to be at the table 
contributing information, contributing expertise, and also learning what the standard settings um, that are that are in the pipeline will be and how they will be used and um, affect or influence the way that industry um, is able to implement and utilize these standards. Next slide, please. And one of the ways in which the IAG has been instrumental in showing how the eFIDO actually has applicable usage on the day-to-day -day trading operations globally is we started to host uh, case studies wanting to not only see how the eFIDO would be implemented, but also trying to map out its functionalities across different parts of the supply, supply chain, measuring both import and export processes, uh, operations personnel that touch the, the eFIDO at any particular point in the supply chain. So to date, since 2018, when we started the case studies, we have conducted 27 case studies, um, primarily in the grain sector, though we learned today that uh, there have been several case studies done in the seeds industry as well, particularly with Mexico. And early observations from the case studies gave us some positive feedback on savings on time and different costs, though we're still mapping up what, what those cost savings were. But ultimately, their biggest um, showcase so far has been we have been able to map out greater efficiency and ease of export and import processes along the supply chain. We have noticed also great collaboration between several industry trade associations, primarily in Argentina, Sierra Sec, on onboarding neighboring uh, economies such as Peru and Colombia. These two countries are not actively um, uh, signed up on the hub or exchanging. However, uh, Argentina has been doing and conducting some onboarding best practices as Argentina and Chile are now fully exchanging uh, digital electronic uh, or digital phytosanitary certificates. So it, it is absolutely critical to ensure participation continues across multiple commodities and economies. One of the main objectives of these case studies, as I said, is to collect hard data that will drive decisions as the e solution project enters its final phases and will continue to look for funding and long-term sustainability options. Next slide, please. One of the, the projects that uh, we are embarking on in 2021 as a continuation to support um, the adoption of several economies into the hub are e adoption workshops. The IAG is will be hosting workshops with regional uh, plant protection organizations and national uh, NPPOs, as well as industry to engage contracting parties in the adoption of the solution. We wanna uh, encourage the conversation and the discussions to start earlier as to not only the benefits of joining the hub or connecting economies to the hub, but how do you do that? And once that economies are connected to the hub, what are the next steps for industry to become involved? We certainly want to bring clarity for industry on how they can be engaging partners in pushing for this adoption and ultimately using this tool to facilitate, to facilitate trade. Our first workshop is scheduled for April 12th. Uh, we will be working with the Bahamas, followed by the Dominican Republic and Korea, though we do have a list of over 12 different economies that are in different stages, as Rose mentioned earlier, uh, different stages of, of adoption of the e -FIDO. But ultimately, as, as you saw on the map, our goal is to ensure that as many economies as possible are in, enrolled and fully engaged with the e -FIDO hub so that actual trade flows can be mapped out, can be tested, and can start to facilitate trade uh, more easily. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time. Happy to take any questions at the end of today's presentation. Thank you so much, Alejandra. That was, uh, is really, really important for us to hear all the work that uh, the IEG has already been doing, but also that there is an interest from the IPPC to carry on maintaining 
and in developing uh, a program at long term to maintain the electronic phytosanitary certificate. So thank you so much for that. And I would like to, without further ado, to go to our last topic of today, which is about the relevance of the international standards to the global movement of seeds. And I would like to invite the chair of the ICEF Phytocentric Committee and Seed Regulatory Lead for Asia in Bayer, Mr. Michael Leader. Michael, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Rose. And it's a pleasure to, to be here today and to be able to present as part of this panel. And it's also a, a, an honor, I guess, to represent the seed industry and to work with and for some amazing people in this role. Uh, and uh, I, I, I value every day that uh, the, the seed industry um, allows me to, to represent them in this way. Uh, I've got a very short time, I think, now, because I see that there are some questions coming up in the, in the chat box, and I do want to make sure we have some time in the end to, to answer queries that are coming in. Uh, so I think I have a, a, I'll try and be quick today, but my presentation today is really about the relevance of the international phytosanitary standards to the global movement of seeds. Really what I want to talk about today is really how the, the issues that the seed industry is, is, is still finding nowadays with seed movement. Uh, and I guess um, that we're still, you know, how we can work together, I guess, and how ISPM 38 can really help to provide solutions uh, to some of this. Now, I'm sure that those of you that are familiar with the ISF and, and have, have probably seen this, this slide uh, a number of times, but I think it is important to continually to emphasize um, the actual special nature of the international seed movement uh, and how really the reason why a special standard to call this out was probably needed. Um, the reason is when seed is being produced to, for growers to finally plant uh, at the end, um, for them to grow into food uh, for the world, it's actually gone through a number of, of, of movements across borders. Uh, I guess it's not just like um, a, a particular fruit that's being grown in one country and going to another. The development of all of the parental lines in one country, production of parent seeds, processing of those parent seeds, production of hybrids, then processing of those hybrids, commercial packaging, then sending to a final market or even six or seven or eight final markets from the same commercial packaging hub. And even after that, it can be re-exported again if it's not needed necessarily in that final market, but growers need it somewhere else because of conditions and environmental impacts. These things have, a, have an extreme um, effect on the cost and the ability to deliver seed. And every time you see one of those movements, there's requirements um, from governments to get it into those countries. If you add those costs, to R&D and to development and to production, you can see that it's starting um, to make a quite costly uh, seed, seed movement uh, and also quite extensive to try and understand the complexity involved from the country of origin to where the final country might be. Um, so I guess from, from our perspective, there are some key phytosanitary issues that we're finding at the moment um, still really on this is that even when a same pest is being, I guess, regulated by a number of different countries from a phytosanitary point of view, they can still have different requirements for that. One may want a field inspection, might, might one may want an ELISA test, might one may want a PCR or area of freedom, some might want two or three at the same time. To try and navigate those, even just for one pest, let alone a number, can prove quite problematic on this. And, and really there are different, I, I think the concept that we're going is that seed actually poses different risks depending on the intended use. Some plants or some seed is actually sent not even for planting, okay? It, it's sent for quality testing, for destructive sampling, which is different to being sown into the environment. Some may actually be going just for small trials in glass houses or, or even in one small area in a country, not for planting commercially across the country. And some of course, yes, is seed for planting, for sowing, for commercial sale in the country. But all of these, depending on the end uses, require different, different phytosanitary risks. And I don't think all of these are taken um, necessarily on board by governments when they're trying to understand phytosanitary risk and, and making import requirements 
for seed, which just becomes a generic um, use pattern, which is also often incorporated, uh, I guess, with the use of, um, of, of other plant parts as well. And I did mention the frequent re-exports and that one particular seed lot or seed harvest can actually have multiple destinations. It can be stored in, in very, in very uh, healthy, cool conditions to, that it can remain viable for a number of years and it can have multiple destinations. So that when we're actually growing a particular over a season, a harvest, we may not necessarily know the destination. So requiring field inspections as an automatic thing can be difficult on some, on some aspects, but understanding the reality and how to make, uh, to make these requirements would be very useful for the seed industry. Again, and I'll get onto this, but which pests are a concern as well on some of this? Uh, where is seed actually a risk relating to certain pests? Some NPPOs are looking at an entire, um, the entire, I guess, species as opposed to seed specifically as a pathway, which actually is actually a reduced risk in terms of all the number of pests that might be associated with a particular crop. And I guess Merrill did touch on this, but there are well-established industry quality management systems that already reduce phytosanitary risk. We'd like to see them actually endorsed and, and, um, and, and, and adapted and understood by governments as well and incorporated uh, and considered in some of their risk assessments as well. We're already reducing and mitigating risk. So maybe some of the more restrictive um, phytosanitary requirements um, and, and non-harmonized requirements may not be necessary when further consideration is given to these things. And here's just an example. I, you know, the International Seed Federation has actually uh, got something called the Regulated Pestis Initiative. You can get access to this on the, on the website, www.worldseed. Um, and what we've actually seen is, is gone through certain crops that are currently regulated with phytosanitary requirements in the world. Uh, somewhere, looked at the total number of pests that might be required to be addressed at some stage if you want to meet all countries' requirements for that particular species, uh, and then had a look in the scientific literature where the seed is actually a pathway. And, and you can see on this that even for the, the 11 that we've looked at now, um, on average around 77%, you know, this crop is not even a host for the species, or, or for the pest, but even if it is um, a host, the seed is actually not the specific pathway either. And so really, if, if you just look at seed, 70% of, of, of regulation right now globally probably doesn't need to be there. Um, and, and the pathway not proven, we can depend about your appropriate level protection and discuss that aspect. But, but this is, this is a quite concerning and, and it really would be useful if, if, if we do actually take the time to have a look at seeds specifically and look at the risks. Um, we do know we've looked at 11. There are a couple of others that should come out this year as well, uh, corn and eggplant. So stay tuned for those also. I'll just give you one example quickly on this. Um, you know, just recently there's been a particular virus, uh, tomato brown rugos fruit virus, that it's become an emerging risk and a problem and of concern to governments. And now I think 20, over 20 countries have decided to regulate this one pest at the moment for moving of tomato and pepper seed into their country. But of course, requirements are not consistent and they're not harmonized. Some require two, uh, three measures to be applied rather than just either lab test or area freedom uh, or, or field inspection. Some are allowing for field trials only, but many do not, you know, and many are requiring testing of mother plants as well at the same time as doing that. Um, there's unique sample sizes, even if it's just a lab test, others, some require particular protocols, some require 20,000 seeds, some require 4,600. Each time, even though we've done a test, we might have to do three, four or five different requirements for the same pest to get it across into different countries. Um, this is, you know, proving almost cost prohibitive when people are starting to do this. Um, and we just want to see if there is some way that we can actually try to bring some order to this as well. Problem is many of these measures have also been introduced as emergency measures. So you can't comment on these through the, the WTO. Um, and, and they really don't, haven't gone through a full pest risk analysis. And we're still waiting um, for the final requirements. And some of these 
can be in place for a long time before we actually see um, a conclusion and certainty on these requirements as well. So I think if you go to the ISF website now, you know, we've made a statement calling for less restrictive and I guess harmonized requirements um, for the movement of, of seed and, and some clarity on, on what's required. And I, I guess what one important thing as well is that even though we're requiring testing and requirements offshore, some countries are now also retesting using different protocols onshore at 100%. So, we're, uh, you know, we're having more and more tests, um, even, you know, on the same thing. And if you require a requirement offshore, then hopefully you will trust that and, and the onshore piece can be at a, at a more random requirement as opposed to 100%. Some responses we've had to this where government, where country, companies have not been, or governments haven't had validated test protocols or other things to understand and get ready for these, um, is that they said, well, that's okay. When you're ready, just store the seed. And, and, and when it's ready, you can bring it in. The reality is that seed is a perishable commodity. Um, it's a living thing and, and it needs to move quickly and it needs to be stored in appropriate conditions if it's going to remain viable. And usually it's produced in just in time for orders. And, and so putting it in place in places where we haven't actually planned for that storage, where there isn't the right environment, can affect quality and germination and other aspects and may affect the grower's ability at the end to be able to use that seed fully. Uh, and, and I don't think that can is necessarily always picked up by NPPOs as well. And so this is where we see the relevance of ISPM 38, I guess, because it provides opportunities to actually talk about seed to advance science-based and harmonized regulation of seed movement. It specifically calls out seed movement, which is really important. It provides guidance on conducting pest risk analysis for seed. It actually does list the different types of uses that seed might be going to and the different types of, of risk that might be associated with those. Um, so it does say that it should be looking at equivalency of measures, measures that should be appropriate to the assessed pest risk. Um, it practices use in seed production. Again, it does recognize that these may be sufficient. You may not necessarily need to add other requirements to address pest risk if you look at the way seed is being produced. And I'll bring in other ISPMs as well, because again, ISPM1 clearly states and shows the equivalency of phytosanitary measures is important. And it's particularly important, I hope I've shown here, for the international movement of seed. Um, look, it does also say that it encourages NPPOs to exchange additional official phytosanitary information. It re-emphasizes what ISPM 12 said about re-exports. It would be great if we could actually get governments in, in, in exporting countries to not just put the actual original first destination, but help to do field inspections and other aspects for other countries as well, um, when, the, when requested by, by the company, because we may well need to move from that processing country to other countries as well. And, and I think it does actually give a reality of things that when a country's requirements are put in place, they need to think uh, about what that will, the impact that might have on the exporting countries. Can they do field inspections? Well, not really for seed already harvested. If I'm gonna bring a new lab test in, actually the country that's the exporting government will need to validate that test as well. Is this something that they validated? Or they go, is there gonna be another six month to a year delay for that to happen? These things, this is, this, this is why equivalency is important as well. All of this is highlighted in ISPM 38 and why we actually see that it's really relevant. And, and uh, we're very excited to see that um, as, as being adopted and, and now starting, hopefully, um, to start the discussion to, to implement it uh, in a bit more detail uh, globally. And just, uh, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. We're always willing to work alongside NPPOs. We have been doing this. Uh, in the development of ISPM 38, and we will continue doing it. Healthy seed is also our goal. Um, healthy seed to growers is our goal. We remain committed to a vision where the world gets the best quality seed, uh, and the best quality seed is accessible to all. We support food security and sustainable agriculture. And I hope what you've seen in the first three presenters here is great examples of how we can work together, and we look forward to, to working with you more going forward. So with that, Rose, thank you very much. And, and I'll, I'll pass the floor back to you.
Thank you so much, Michael. And yes, very great final falters indeed. Yes, we do want to work together with the NPPOs and with IPPC with all these issues that we have brought here together today. And with that, I would like to say thank you to all the panelists and open the floor for some questions and answers. And I believe we already have a few questions and answers. I'm aware of the time, but I, I would like to go at least for some three questions that has been here. And I, I would love to hear the answer to that. And the first one is for you, Meryl, and is what is the timeline for the systems approach in ICPM 38? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, these timelines, the, the processes in IPPC, they do take uh, some time. There, first, there has to be a, a working group, then a country consultation, then another round of consultation. So it'll easily be, uh, let's say, five years before the new annex will be ready. Okay, thank you, Meryl. Uh, so we do have one here. Um, Will there be a standard to make sure that the systems approach will get automatic multilateral acceptance by multiple NPPOs? Yeah, no, that is that is not foreseen. In the end, is of course uh, a country's choice what they want to accept as legislation, as their regulations, and all the ISPM, the IPPC standards, they are guidelines. They are not. They are not law. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Meryl. So there is a question here for Alejandro, if you could answer, is about e -phyto. So how much experience is available in e -phyto with re-exportation, which is common practice in our industry? How do the seed companies get inside in the ADs, which is absolutely critical to continue our business? So as far as we know, the re-exportation process, it's going country by country. We know that the United States is uh, receiving what we would call imports from certain countries like Argentina, starting to with Mexico, but we haven't seen that adoption fully yet. And that's part of the problem with not having as many economies enrolled or adopted uh, into the hub um, because we cannot test and we cannot um, open both windows at the same time. So at this point, it's going on a case by case basis, but I can report uh, that we have had some successes with Argentina, Brazil, uh, doing re-exporting and Argentina, Mexico as well. Yeah, so there is another two questions uh, for, for you, to Alejandro. So, and this is coming from one of our colleagues. What is the status on the electronic certification case of re-export? How much is tested? And is additional official five center information for re-export purpose also exchanged? So I, I think I answered that on the last question. So this is on a case by case basis. Unfortunately, um, we've not been able to have enough economies um, do case, or I should say actually not enough uh, commodity sectors do case studies because not all the economies that are currently fully exchanging or on production mode, which means that each country is able to, to exchange in a safe mode. Um, we don't have a lot of exporting economies and enough importing economies that share trade lanes to be able to test. So for the seed industry, uh, as I mentioned before, as, uh, we had a case study between the US and Chile, and we had a case study, we, we've had several case studies of um, the US and Mexico but Mexico just came online at the beginning of this year. So that tells you that we're still pretty far away from fully being able to understand the implications of the eFIDO, which is why the IAG, Rose and I are pushing for these workshops so that we can actually have these conversations with the MPPOs on how critical it is that we get more exporting economies listed, but also importing economies where we can test these viability options. Oh, that's that's a very good point indeed. So there is, uh, if I can go to the last question before, because it's already five minutes past the, the two o'clock here, and this is for Michael Leader. So we can uh, the countries agree that they are mutually transparent about which test methods for seeds and which protocols they use for the seed test during the import of seeds? Michael, what do you think? 
I'm still trying to understand, I think, on that one. But, I, you know, I, I, the more transparency that happens around, around between countries and MPPOs, the best, uh, the better. I, I think we're still um, finding some problems with actually working out what protocols are being used for their testing onshore. There's a lot of internal testing. And, and I think I made the point um, when I was discussing that there's still concerns about if you're testing 100% of stuff coming into your country, but still requiring 100% testing by another one. How are you going to eventually, um, how are we going to deal with those different data points that are being generated? I think um, some transparency and discussion about this and when you're, it's not just the protocols, but it's the reagents and, and other aspects that are being used. And it's not just the primers. Uh, so there's a lot of other aspects that there needs to, we all need to start building some more trust between each other to, to really um, improve that. So I'm hopeful that one, that we will get there and ISPM 38 is a good step up, I guess, to start that discussion. That's great, thank you so much. I'm afraid we have already passed five minutes of the hour that it was to be finished this uh, webinar. I would like to say thank you very much for the panelists. You still have some questions on the q and I would urge you to go there and please answer. And I also would like to say a huge thank you to all the participants who took the time to come here to listen to us. And it's very important that we will keep maintaining the message, we keep delivering all the information that we have and working together with the NPPOs and working together with IPPC to be able to have all these uh, topics addressed even further, but we wanted to do this together. We wanted to work together. So I would like to say thank you to everybody. And I'm really thankful for all the panelists for the excellent presentations today. And thank you so much for all the participants. And with that, I would like to finish this webinar wishing everyone uh, a good day, a good afternoon or a good evening and stay safe and stay healthy. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.